Hello, Psychology Society Conference. So there's a very good chance that I might not be able to join you at the time that this talk is airing. I had, unfortunately, a previous engagement. Um, uh, I'm currently on the uh, Isle of Lewis in Stornoway. Um, so if I haven't been able to join you, then I'm very sorry. If I have been able to join you, well done, Emily. Well done for finding uh, some phone signal. Good on you. Um, this talk is going to be about LGBTQIA plus psychology kind of education. Very general. I'm going to touch on a few things. Um, and although it's just me on the video, this talk is very much in collaboration with Professor Lisa De Bruyne, who is my queer partner in crime uh, in uh, psychology and neuroscience. Um, Lisa has been um, running Rainbow Office Hours with me. Uh, for um, several years now, um, and it's also the kind of the co-lead of the um, LGBTQIA plus uh, psychology reading group. So what I'm going to cover in this talk is, broadly speaking, uh, three things. First of all, I'm going to talk about the history of LGBT education, um, kind of generally, not just in psychology. So I'm going to touch on Section 28, um, the Scottish Inclusive Education uh, Programme. And then also, finally, a recent report from UCAS and Stonewall, specifically about the experience of LGBT students in, uh, in education and kind of looking at, at universities in particular. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about the history of um, LGBT uh, psychology. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how psychology has and have harmed the LGBTQ community in terms of actually pathologizing uh, gender and, and, and sexual, uh, sexual diversity and things like, you know, the history of uh, conversion therapy um, and, and BPS and so on. Um, and then finally, I'm going to, um, the, the final bit of the talk, I'm going to look at queering the cur curriculum uh, in the School of Psychology and Neuroscience and talk a little bit about what we've done, why we've done it, um, and where I see uh, the future and what I think is going to be important, because, of course, uh, you guys are the future. You will be the future uh, lecturers um, of psychology. Um, and I think it's it's important to be honest about where we are and where we want to be. OK, so the history of LGBTQIA uh, education. Uh, very, very generally. This is going to be an extremely, extremely brief um, overview uh, of kind of the, the, the main points of LGBT history. Um, there's loads of stuff at the moment um, because it's LGBT History Month in the UK. So I would encourage you, if you want to learn more about this stuff, to go and do a deeper dive because um, there's, there's so much more than what I'm going to touch on. It's really just to try and give you a sense of where we came from and, and where we are now. So a big, big milestone in um, the in, in the history of, of LGBT rights um, and education uh, in the UK um, was a law that was known as Section 28. And Section 28 was brought in from uh, 1988 uh, and it lasted until the year 2000 in Scotland, although it was uh, not repealed in England and Wales until 2003, which fun times was my entire time at school. Um, what this prohibited was the promotion of homosexuality. And basically what this meant was that there could be no positive representations of gay people. You know, and, and I, I'm saying gay people, obviously I mean the entire queer community, um, although at the time it really was, you know, just focused on homosexuality. Um, because, you know, the understanding of sexual fluidity and diversity is, is has, has grown over um, the last 20 years. Um, there was a Conservative Party conference in 1987 where Margaret Thatcher, uh, the Prime Minister at the time, very famously um, gave a speech where she said that children are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. Please appreciate my uh, impression of Margaret Thatcher. Um, and there was very much a sense at the time that being gay and being queer should not be mentioned in schools, that it absolutely was not suitable. Um, it had no place uh, in education. And of course, remember to put this in the context of the 1980s. So we're kind of, you know, at, at, the, at the height of the AIDS pandemic. 
um, and a lot of misinformation and a lot of fear and project, uh, prejudice, particularly being aimed um, at gay men. The impact of Section 28 was that there was no LGBT sex education, there was no support, there was no positive representations in schools. Um, and um, this kind of, it, it affected both sides. So obviously it affects LGBT uh, students, uh, pupils who were not able to get any information about any of this stuff. You know, if you think about how much sex education, how much heterosexual sex education you get and stuff about contraception and things like that, you got absolutely nothing in terms of, you know, like uh, sex education if, if you were queer. Um, but also on the other side, you know, if you were um, a, a queer teacher, then there was this fear of coming out um, that you couldn't be seen to be um, uh, a queer teacher because, of course, being a queer teacher, there would, would be positive representation. Um, so it was this idea that, you know, it's not illegal, but we certainly don't want um, to, to encourage it. As I said, my entire schooling was conducted under Section 28, which is obviously not something I was aware of um, at the time. But when I look back now, I can see its influence in my entire um, school education. I can remember um, queerness being referred to twice. Uh, once was when I was um, I took child development for GCSE uh, and my teacher who there was a lot of extra sex education involved in, in child development as you as you can imagine um and uh towards the end of the class and I'm still not quite sure why it was brought up but I remember her saying to the class do you know how gay men have sex and of course none of us did because of section 28 um and not really been discussed um and she went and this is true and she said in front of the entire class she went they do it up the bottom and that was my LGBT sex education. So it is somewhat of a wonder that I uh, am <laughs> here right now. Uh, the second mention of it was when they, uh, my sociology teacher uh, referred to dungaree wearing lesbians, which obviously is slightly stereotypical. But the bigger issue there was that I was sitting uh, in that classroom wearing dungarees, um, which was an interesting day. Um, it turns out it was actually several years um, before I kind of actually realised uh, that I was queer myself. I was wearing dungarees because Eminem used to wear dungarees and I was a very cool child. Um, but that was it. That was that was the entire mention um, of, uh, of homosexuality, of queerness, of anything to do with the queer community in my entire uh, school education. Fast forward 20 years and things are certainly getting better and a huge change from section 28 scotland has now become the first country in the entire world to embed lesbian gay bisexual and transgender inclusive education across the school curriculum so so school age pupils are going to be taught about you know the lgbt history they're going to be taught um, about positive uh, role models. There's going to be positive representation in schools, and this is going to be uh, in law. And there are um, organizations such as uh, the Thai Campaign, uh, which is the Time for Inclusive Education campaign that have been working for, for many years now, um, and organizations like LGBT Youth Scotland, um, who have really helped uh, feed into this. It's such a massive change from Section 28 and it's such good progress. Although it's obviously it's important to recognise that, you know, it's going to take a lot of time. This has become uh, law from, I believe it's 2021, um, that the curriculum had to be LGBT inclusive. So it's going to take, you know, many, many years for this to really filter through and for us to actually see uh, proper progress. I suppose it's also worth saying that it's, you know, if we think about the impact of teaching about racism and stuff like that in schools, you know, just because racism is governed in schools certainly doesn't mean um, that it's ended, or indeed it doesn't mean that just because this stuff is covered in schools doesn't mean it's going to be covered well. But the point is that things are moving. Um, there is progress, um, even though it might be uh, quite slow. 
So there was a, a report by um, UCAS, which is the uh, admissions service in the UK. So many of you will, will have, have come through UCAS. All of you come through UCAS um, and, uh, and Stonewall. Um, and they were looking at applications from UK domiciled applicants. So this doesn't include um, international students and so on. Um, uh, so what they found was that 7.2% of applicants to university um, put down in their application that they are LGBT, which is two and a half times the national average. Um, and within this 0.4% uh, were transgender. Just to put that in context, at Glasgow, the University of Glasgow, 14% of uh, students um, are noted as LGBT. So I think it's important when you um, look at these figures uh, to realise that they're actually properly, uh, they're underestimating because, because, of course, these are people who um, were actually aware that they were uh, queer, when they applied, these are people who um, are, were willing to put down, they're in that category uh, and so on. You know, for example, I, would, I, I, I did not know when I applied to university um, who I was. Um, so, uh, yeah, 7.2%, 7, 7 but I would, I would probably raise that uh, a little bit more. Um, there's a few things about the profile of LGBT students that um, are both interesting and, and somewhat concerning to me as an educator. 17% um, of LGBT students come from the most disadvantaged areas, and this compares to 13% of applicants who are heterosexual or who put um, prefer not to say. LGBT um, students are also more likely to declare a disability um, uh, than non-LGBT students, so 30% to 12%. Um, and in particular, a mental health condition, 13% to 2.9%. And obviously, those are those figures are that's a fairly stark difference. Um, the report also uh, asked people, you know, if you had a positive experience at school, why why do you think this was? Why do you think it was good? And the most commonly cited reason was that students felt accepted. Um, you know, in school by their peers. Um, and when it came to trans students, 84% of them who said their experience was good attributed that to actually being able to talk openly about their identity, you know, not just to be tolerated, but to be accepted. Of the people who said that their experience in school and college wasn't good, the most common reason was that their identity, their queerness was not reflected in the things that they learned at school or college. So this is in terms of that LGBT inclusive curriculum, the positive representations. You know, if, if you're not having a good experience, um, it, it looks like that is very, very largely being driven um, by um, just a, a complete lack of, of representation and visibility. Um, so, you know, if, if we if we look at this and we, we look at where we were with Section 28, again, things are getting uh, much better. But it is really, really important um, for both staff and students um, that, you know, we can be open about these topics, that we can have uh, representation um, and, you know, an inclusive curriculum. And one of the things this report highlighted um, and one of the things that is, is deeply, deeply important to me is the well-being of uh, trans students um, because they are at particular risk. Um, and the reason that they are at risk is because um, of the extreme prejudice um, that many trans people face. Uh, particularly in the UK, that is kind of uh, internationally recognised for the level of transphobia in the media. Um, it's something I, I care about a huge amount. Um, and uh, trans students, trans colleagues, um, trans people everywhere need allies, both from within and out with uh, the LGBT community. So... In this section, I'm going to look at the history of LGBTQ uh, psychology. Now, if you are in uh, level one and two, you're going to recognize that I have um, <laughs> taken these slides from my history of psychology lecture that I gave in first year. But if you are in level three and four, you haven't seen this yet. So um, it'll be a good recap for some and, and maybe some new information uh, for others. 
Um, so as many of you will be uh, aware, homosexuality was classified as a mental disorder for many years. Um, and the treatment treatment for homosexuality that was developed by psychologists included things like aversion therapy. Um, so this is where gay people were made to look at photos of, um, you know, uh, same sex um uh, couples, um, you know, same-sex sexual encounters, and then they were given electric shocks or chemicals that would make them vomit to try and link uh, same-sex attraction and disgust. Um, uh, the people are also forced um, to have um, sex with sex workers, um, to have heterosexual sex, to watch heterosexual pornography in the name of psychological treatment. Um, uh, homosexuality was declassified by the DSM in uh, 1973, but it wasn't actually until 1992 that the same happened for the World Health Organization's ICD. In addition, um, the APA released a statement that opposed conversion therapy for LGBTQ people in 1998. So conversion therapy is where you try and cure people uh, from being gay, and it's incredibly psychologically harmful. Um, but it actually took the BPS until 2017 uh, to do the same, uh, which is slightly horrifying. Um, although I will say you with the, the new BPS uh, sexuality section, which I'll come to in a bit, um, and Adam Jowett, who is, is also speaking at this conference, that there has been a huge amount of work done. But actually, these, these dates for things um, are maybe not as far in the past uh, as you may have thought. Um, the reason that these kind of milestones are important is because organizations like the, the APA, the BPS are huge, um, and they have a lot of influence about what we as psychologists say about, um, and, and, you know, what we as psychologists say about different groups of people has a very real impact on people's daily lives. The classification of homosexuality as a mental disorder helped support the idea that gay people were sick and that they should be cured. Um, and, you know, this idea still persists today. If we look at places like Poland and Russia um, and the rise of the far right, uh, you know, transphobia in the UK and the USA, it's the same arguments coming back again and again. On the flip side, psychological research has helped the understanding of the LGBT community. Um, all the way back in 1948, uh, the work of Kinsey et al. showed that, you know, when it comes to sexuality, we don't fit in neat boxes. Sexuality is fluid. Uh, it's a continuum. And most people don't actually fall completely at one end of the spectrum or the other, not completely heterosexual or completely uh, homosexual. Um, and obviously, this is this is groundbreaking work that helps people understand themselves and gives gives people the language to describe themselves, which is incredibly uh, powerful. But there's also, you know, things like psychology has um, shown that, you know, uh, same same sex parents are just as good uh, for children uh, as kind of traditional heterosexual um, parents. And all of this work has helped promote um, acceptance and diversity. When it comes to gender identity, we are much further behind. Um, being transgender was only declassified as a disorder by the DSM in 2013 and by the ICD in 2019. Um, and I know that after COVID time no longer has any meaning, but you know that was only three years ago. Um, and if you think about what I've just said about the impact of declassifying homosexuality 50 years ago, you can see why it's difficult to say currently that psychology as a field has been particularly helpful to, for trans people, you know, especially given that the incidence of severe mental health problems is, is in, in trans people is astronomically high because of the, the stigma um, that they face because of the way that we have categorized gender diversity. Um, the treatment of gender by psychology, of course, isn't just related to issues related to trans people, you know, male mental health issues have been historically ignored, this idea that real men don't cry or talk about their feelings, um, uh, you know, this has had a, um, a, a serious effect on, on male mental health, um, suicide rates in men are, are you know, much, much higher than they are in women. Um, but this has started to be addressed. So there are organizations um, such as the BPS's uh, male psychology section and the APA's psychology 
of men and sexuality. So again, there's definitely progress. We're really starting to recognize um, what it is about categorizing gender and sexuality in these very rigid ways, the harm that that has, and how we should actually be supporting um, this kind of diversity uh, in, in, in psychology as a profession. So as I mentioned uh, briefly before, we now have the BPS Psychology of uh, Sexualities section. Um, and this was originally founded as the lesbian and gay psychology section, um, but is um, expanded um, to kind of, you know, cover all LGBT um, uh, work um, and, um, and to support uh, queer psychologists. Um, and the work that they have been doing in the last few years is really um really to be applauded, particularly the stuff around um, conversion therapy um, and kind of trying to, to make sure that, you know, the, the government and the changes in law um, are uh, supported by evidence uh, and that they're, you know, in um, supporting the well-being of the LGBT community. Um, they're also working towards, you know, trying to develop non-heterosexist and gender inclusive forms of research and theory uh, and clinical practice. So very, very broad remit. And the work they're doing is really, really important. I said uh, just before that, um, you know, some of these dates are maybe not uh, quite as far away um, as you would think. And actually, the, um, the original section was founded in 1998. Um, and in 1998... Um, the BPS Journal of Psychologist, which is the main flagship magazine, actually published anti-lesbian and anti-gay correspondence under the heading, Are You Normal? The main psychologist magazine published that. Um, members of, of the, the, the lesbian and gay uh, section were sent uh, hate mail. Um, and even though it did pass, um, that the section was formed, it got more... Uh, it got more votes uh, against votes than anything had ever got before. 1,623 members of the BPS voted against um, forming a lesbian and, and gay psychology section in 1998. And the thing is, that is so recent, at least to me, but it might be because I'm getting old. That is so recent that I thought that, I read that as 1988. It makes more sense in my head for that to be 1988. That is just, it's really concerning me um, not that far away. Um, and I think what's really important is to keep that in mind when you are reading articles about transgender people right now, because this is what's happening now. And I really, really hope that in 20 years, someone is doing a talk where they're going, I can't believe that in 2022, psychologists were publicly saying this stuff about trans people. I really hope that we're going to have the same kind of progression because it is just history repeating itself. Um, in terms of uh, what the um, what the BPS um, states in its um, graduate basis for, for chartered uh, membership. So basically, uh, as hopefully you know, um, your psychology degrees are accredited by the BPS. And essentially what that accreditation means is that we have to teach you a certain set of stuff. There is a core curriculum uh, that we have to cover. And these are the different areas so biological, cognitive, developmental, individual differences, social, conceptual and historical issues, research methods and the empirical project. And obviously there's some um, kind of notes about what we have to cover within these, but there's also a lot of uh, variability um, and when it comes to um, LGBT representation in the curriculum, one of the issues is that this is not yet something that's kind of very explicitly specified. And having that variability means that what we're, we're kind of seeing is individual um, pockets of good practice. Um, and I mean that both in terms of, you know, individual institutions and schools, but also even within individual institutions and schools on individual courses, you might see pockets of good practice. Um, but we're not yet, I think, at a stage where um, this kind of coverage in the curriculum is really as standard. So there are certain topics like, you know, individual differences, developmental, social, um, that, that lend themselves um, more 
to uh, teaching about this kind of stuff, you know, the development of gender, individual differences, gender and sexuality, social psychology, if you're looking at things like attraction and so on. These are the, the places where it's very easy to be um, a- inclusive. Um, and I'll, I'll come on in a second to talk about what we have tried um to do uh, with that but one of the things I, I really believe very strongly is that it's not enough to have LGBT representation and education in those specific kind of siloed areas so if you only ever mention queer people when you're talking about you know the development of gender or sexuality differences you know it, it kind of it, it puts us in this this other box of this like niche little topic. Instead, I really believe that the representation of queer people should be everywhere. Um, We should be in examples. You know, if you you have exam questions and we have to come up with examples and stuff like that, there should be a way of embedding this regardless of what you are teaching. It's not enough just to have, you know, the queer lecture and go, right, okay, tick that box uh, and moved on and I also think that it's it's time that you know in the same way that that the Scottish government has said that um uh, the LGBT uh, education has to be LGBT inclusive um that that the core uh accreditation curriculum for the BPS um should also look to be a little bit more specific in terms of what needs to be covered when it comes to this kind of um, inclusive thing because there's currently uh, a lot uh, of leeway and I can certainly tell you um that at my previous institution there was there was there was nothing um I but still accredited um and so it does really make uh, a difference so that's what I want to talk about now which is what we've done and why we've done it um just to try and give you a sense um, of of yeah what, what we've been working on uh, for the last couple of years. And obviously these examples that I'm going to give you from the School of Psychology and Neuroscience at Glasgow are the examples that I'm aware of. Um, there are, I'm going to draw my own work, obviously, um, and, and the work of other people I know. There will be much, there'll, there'll be other examples. Uh, and please don't take this as an exhaustive list. Um, I'm incredibly lucky, I think, to work at Um, at the University of Glasgow in psychology and to have um, a team of people around me who regardless of whether or not they're queer are uh, amazing queer allies um, and and are really committed to inclusivity so yeah please don't take this as as an exhaustive list there will be a lot of other um, examples. Um, So one of the things that I've tried to do is to embed inclusivity throughout um, all topics. Um, so I said before, you know, I, I don't believe this idea that that people should be uh, siloed, you know, queerness should be siloed, um, that it should be there in, in, in all topics. Um, and, you know, some people will say to me about LGBT inclusive education, oh, well, you know, it's, it's easy for, for you to do. You teach psychology, you teach individual differences. Of, of course, you can be inclusive. You know, I teach like statistics and maths. Like it's, it's not that easy. Mm-hmm. I say, mm-hmm. but it is. So this is um, this is from uh, the level one uh, data skills book. Um, if you are currently in level one, this is uh, coming up. You've got the joy of probability <sighs> in week seven and eight. And just everybody loves probability. Um, but you might recognize this. So this is in one of the probability chapters. And this was one of the original uh, probability problems that was that was in the book. So Fiona is a very tall Scottish woman um, who will only date men who are taller than her. What proportion of uh, Scottish men would Fiona be willing to date? And you can do this using the kind of the probability functions and the normal distribution in R. Um, of course, one of the changes um, I wanted to make to, to, to the um, the, the data skills book was just to add in a couple of more examples because this stuff is quite difficult. So I thought oh, it, it would be nice um, to have a few more um, uh, examples um, to help try and, uh, you know, consolidate um, uh, what's going on with probability. So this is what I added, added in, which was, on the other hand, Fiona will only date women who are shorter than her. And that was it. Okay. But it's, bisexual representation and I know it seems like such a silly little thing um, but there are so many examples um, like this 
um, where, you know, you, you have to give, you know, you've got to come up with an imaginary person or a couple or whatever. And those are the opportunities to embed inclusivity. Um, throughout the curriculum it's that thing you know from the UCAS report about being seen being open having that positive representation um, I used to work with um, I, I uh, with, a, with a woman called uh, Ellie Barnes who runs this uh, charity called Educate and Celebrate she works in schools a lot um, and she said that her goal was not to normalize queerness because that just perpetuated the idea that there was a normal that you know normal is a statistical property um instead her goal was to usualize queerness and i really really like that and that's kind of stayed with me which is that i'm not trying to normalize it, i'm just trying to usualize it i just want it to be kind of a usual part of life that you will see uh, examples of queerness um another example uh, again from level one so if you're in uh, level one two you will have have done this essays um, if you're in level uh, three and four, you won't. But this is now the um, uh, essay questions in Psychology 1A in the first semester. Um, and these were part of kind of a wider initiative to decolonize the curriculum uh, and to, to try and, and give a more honest and critical account of the history of psychology. So there's, there's questions about racism um, and, and women in psychology and so on. But um, we also now uh, give the first years the opportunity to look at the history of um, gender and uh, sexual diversity and about the, you know, the, the history of psychology and the LGBTQ community. So again, kind of just trying to embed it in part of the curriculum. Actually, you know, at level one, really, the, the essay is about learning how to um, write academically. It's about uh, looking up evidence, using citations, all that kind of stuff. The essay questions in first year psychology could be on any topic, realistically, um, because it's the underlying skills that we actually care about. Um, but again, it's thinking about, you know, what opportunities do I have to present a more inclusive, diverse uh, view um, of the world? So that's one of the things uh, that we've done. And, uh, you know, uh, obviously, I love all of the markings that I do. Um, but marking these essays really is um, is a wonderful experience as an educator. Um, I learned so much from reading these essays. It, it was really um, it really was a positive experience, and it's been uh, applauded by our external examiner um, as a as best practice in the curriculum. Um, but of course, there are there are lots of other examples. Um, so uh, Kiara Holland, uh, I know, does uh, the, the development of, of gender um, in her level two lectures. Um, and uh, I believe Dr. Patterson uh, in, in social psychology as as well. Um, yeah, th there, there, there will be there will be many more examples um, where you know we we have really tried to ensure that um, our curriculum is uh, inclusive. Although obviously, I don't believe that it's perfect. We definitely have you know there's there's always progression to be made, but it's certainly something that we're very very aware of. Um, the final thing um, that we've really tried to do in psychology and neuroscience is to increase representation of queer members of staff. And this is something else that's, that's very, very important to me. Um, you cannot be what you cannot see. Um, I love that. I, I wish that I had had queer teachers at school. I wish that I'd actually had the first queer academic that I knowingly met when I was in my undergraduate uh, was my fourth year dissertation supervisor. And I actually did not find out that they were queer until uh, towards the end uh, of my dissertation uh, period. Um, and I didn't actually, I, I came out between, I came out at the start of my fourth year at university, which I would, as timing goes, coming out and writing a dissertation at the same time, just not amazing. Um, but I do sometimes wonder if maybe I might have figured some things out earlier if I'd had any kind of representation, any kind of role models, um, you know, outside of, of my group uh, of friends. Um, you have to be able to see people in careers that you want to go into. Um, and quite often, I think that representation seems to be confined to you know media figures like there's, there's lots of you know entertainers movie stars all that kind of stuff um social media uh youtubers tiktok whatever there's lots of people there 
Um, but you know, you also need to know that you can be a teaching track lecturer, like, and be gay. Um, that's also important. That kind of just day to day, almost you know, boring representation, the usualization uh, of queerness. So we have done uh, a number of things, um, and hopefully um, you will be aware of these. <laughs> because <laughs> if you're not I'm maybe not doing my job quite well uh rainbow office hours have now been running for a few years um and this year we we took the opportunity to um formalize some of the guidance we're doing and we've um been advertising it to other schools um around the university of glasgow so we're hoping that we might start to see rainbow office hours popping up uh in other schools uh, as well um and rainbow office hours are or one of those things where actually attendance at them can be quite low, but that's not the point of them. Rainbow office hours, um, if, if you're not aware, um, are where um, LGBTQ members of staff uh, offer um, an extra hour of office hours, specifically to talk about LGBTQ issues. So we send around a list of you know names and times and stuff. Um, and the power of rainbow office hours is not actually in people attending them. It's in that there are five, six people in psychology who are queer and who are happy to be visible about being queer. Um, the, the email that we send with that list of names is actually one of the most important things um, about Rainbow Office Hours because it's a signal that you can be here if you are queer. You, you, you can be an academic, you can, you know, you can exist in this world. Um, we also have the, the LGBTQ uh, reading group, um, which has been running um, since last year. We do uh, monthly um, uh, seminars, discussions and talks. Uh, speed friending has been run, um, Rainbow Speed Friending, trying to give um, LGBTQ students the opportunity to meet each other. Um, and I think that's really important, particularly for people who are at different stages at their journey. Um, if you're just coming out um, and you don't really know you know any any member of the community or you have a lot of questions then actually that that space to meet other people can be really important uh, we've also um encouraged uh staff and students to put their pronouns on zoom um on on lecture slides and stuff like that i um i i send when the the level one team get the slides for the labs um the template that they get has you know like tutor name and and pronouns um and stuff just to try and to kind of again usualize the idea of of being um open uh, about this um, and then also we have our uh the social media um for the school as well um which uh is 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 very good at you know making sure that there is this awareness building on things like you know trans awareness week lgbt history month national coming out day um and so on and that we are you know showing that um these things are important at to for raising awareness and for education um a couple of things to finish off first of all i think with this kind of representation stuff one thing that is just as important is to recognize that whilst representation is incredibly positive it does put a burden on the community itself i love lgbt history month i love all of the stuff that goes on but i am also busier in lgbt history month than i would be in other months um and sometimes what happens is that as a member of the community and this doesn't just go for being being queer but you know people of color kind of get roped into doing a lot of of, of the work um, in terms of anti-racism stuff. Um, and this is this is this is not to say that I don't enjoy it. I do. It's actually it, it's something that I, I deeply care about. And it's a really important part of who I am to kind of be at, you know, actively doing something. But it's also recognized to uh, it's also important to recognize that for some queer people, it's not. Um, some queer people just want to go about their day <laughs> and not have to fight. And that's also OK. Um, and, you know, there's there's different parts of your personality or different parts of your experience that you are willing to to talk about. Um, for me, I'm very happy to talk openly um, about being queer and my experience of being queer. Um, I also grew up very poor and had a not ideal childhood. I don't talk about that stuff very much because I am, 
I just, no, <laughs> it's no, I, I just can't do it. Um, and for other people, um, it might be the same for being queer. They might be quite happy to talk about, you know, growing up poor or, or anything like that, but they don't want to talk about being queer. And, you know, I, I think when it comes to things like, for example, pronouns on, on, on Zoom, we do have to be careful that, you know, you can't force these things on everyone because some people might not want to put their pronouns on because their pronouns might be, you know, they, them, but they, they don't want to have that. It's, it's not something that they want to... Um, actually out you know for for members of staff this is our workplace and it is really important to draw a healthy line between work and your personal life um so yeah i i think i think there's that side of it that's really important that you know when, when you're thinking about what more can be done and what more should be done also consider who will be doing that <laughs> um uh and and um you know it shouldn't be an expectation that the burden should be put on the community uh, itself. Um, the final thing is, I, again, just to acknowledge that I don't think that psychology and uh, neuroscience at Glasgow is is perfect. Um, you know, we, we, we have a, a way to go. There's still work that we could be doing on making the curriculum more inclusive. Um, you know, things like trans representation, um, uh, supporting supporting our trans students, you know, I, and hopefully, hopefully, um, wider society will will become uh, more accepting and more tolerating. Uh, but we do need to make sure that we are there for our trans students, um, uh, particularly at the moment, and 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 all students, obviously. But you know, there are there are particular issues um, that are, are uh, that some people are facing um, at the moment. Um, what I will say, I want to because I want to end on a positive note. Um, which is that as a member of staff, I feel incredibly lucky to work at the School of Psychology and Neuroscience at Glasgow. Um, I joined in November 2018 um, and my previous institution, I uh, had had some issues with, um, I'd had some homophobic comments in the EVASIS that said that I, um, I, I wasn't a good teacher, that I was unprofessional uh, because because I was, you know, visibly uh, and, and openly uh, queer. Um, and it really deeply affected me. I would walk into classrooms and obviously it's all anonymous. So I, every classroom I would walk into and I'd be like, was it you? You know, do, do, I, do I have to teach the person who thinks that I shouldn't be allowed to do my job because I'm queer? Um, and, and I also had a, a lack of support shall we say, from senior management in, in my previous institution um, at, about that time. Um, so the week before, a couple of weeks before I left my previous institution, there was um, National Coming Out Day, it's in October, and I had put up two massive, one big rainbow flag and one big trans flag in the window of my office because uh, I was on the ground floor at the time, which meant that sometimes the management had to walk past them every day to go into work, which, you know, it's the little things that get you through the day. Um, and when I got to Glasgow, I was unpacking my office and Professor Stack walked into my office. And the first thing she said was, where are your flags? And I felt like I had come home. Um, it genuinely it makes me it makes me slightly tear up at the thought because it was it was one of those things where I'd had such an awful um uh experience uh, and not, not feeling supported and I got here and that and that was the first thing she asked and I will never ever forget that um we are not perfect but um I think LGBT representation uh in Glasgow is certainly um going in the right direction um as always i'm happy to uh take uh, any suggestions any comments uh, any concerns that any of you have regardless of whether or not you are a part of the lgbtq community um because i think this is definitely something uh, that we all have to um do together um and finally i've uh uh, got together a collection of resources that I will um, share uh, underneath uh, uh, the video somewhere in the conference. So I hope that was uh, helpful and informative, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, some of the discussion.